Uh, I'm Terry McMahon, and I have the privilege of being the president of Hodges University. And let me forewarn you, if you hear some drilling type sounds going on, we are remodeling the library downstairs, and that's what you're hearing. We had a great uh, ribbon cutting ceremony here at the university yesterday or day before yesterday, and some of you were in attendance there. We were pleased to have you back again, uh, but we are uh, continuing to grow and expand. Uh, it's my pleasure, first of all, to welcome all of our public servants to the uh, Hispanic Institute's uh, forum today, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see the turnout, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, hearing our, our public servants comment on civic engagement and how important that is for our community. Uh, before I introduce our uh, executive director of the Expanded Institute, who will then introduce our guest, I'd like to recognize some of the folks out in the audience who are very important to us. Uh, Israel Suarez from the Nations Association. Israel, thank you for being here. Michelle Drogery, who was the 2012 Lee County Citizen of the Year and 2012 Grand Down. Michelle. Uh, and we have three uh, Hispanic Institute Advisory Council members with us. Robert Forrest, so Robert. Uh, Louise Rivera. And Leonardo Garcia. And I'm going to ask Leonardo to come on here. He's got some special guests with him who I'd like for him to introduce. Come on up, Leonardo. As you know, this forum is so important, so we brought it government delegation from the Dominican Republic here today. So we have uh, from uh, the government, Luis Rivera, I mean Luis Rodriguez, <laughs> Maria Cartis, <laughs> Luis Damián, Jose Torres, and the chief of the DR customs, Miguel Mejia, <laughs> DR customs, Sara Binaya, Partner that we have here in town, Stephen Stafford, and soon coming will be Congressman Victor Suarez on his way. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. Uh, uh, Carmen Ray Gomez is, a, is the executive director of the Hispanic Institute, and she told me to be quick, get out of the way, because she wants to get to it. So uh, <laughs> come on up. Thank you, Dr. McMahon. Uh, my name is Carmen Ray Gomez. I'm the director of the Hispanic Institute, and I would like to welcome you all once more. Just a quick housekeeping. If you need to go to the restroom, the men's restroom is right down this hall. The women's restroom is around the corner near the elevator. Uh, also, you have materials on your chairs, uh, reports that have been done through the Hispanic Institute, the Institute brochure, the program for today, and I would like to ask you to please complete the survey uh, once, you're, once the form is completed so that we can use that for future planning. Again, my name is Carmen. The Hispanic Institute is honored to host this first civic engagement forum here at Hodges University today. One of the primary HI goals or objectives is to provide a forum for public policy matters and to promote a better understanding of, of the political process and public policy and how that impacts both the Hispanic and larger community. We believe that in order to be a participating citizen in a democracy, it is important that each person be educated and informed about the public issues affecting their professional and personal lives. Also, in order to be a responsible business and social entrepreneur, it is important that we know how local, state, national, and even international laws affect our organizations, agencies, and businesses. Here at Hodges, we also believe that it is important that our students understand the importance of their involvement in the larger community. Participating in forums like these can help enhance learning about the issues affecting the community, and it is an excellent way to become involved. So what is civic engagement? Civic engagement means working to make a difference in the civic life of our communities and developing the combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to make that difference. It means promoting the quality of life in a community through both political and non-political processes. We are pleased to have a panel of some of our 
elected local officials who will have 10 minutes each to share with you what motivated them to become civically engaged, what role do they play in our community as elected officials, and how do they serve the people they represent, and most importantly, how can you get involved in your community? I would like to first introduce Commissioner Ray Judah, who graduated from California State University with a Master's of Science in Natural Resources and a Bachelor's of Arts in Zoology. He has served the citizens of Lee County since 1988. Next to him, we have Ms. Sharon Harrington, who graduated from Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, Ohio, and Edison State College in Fort Myers, majoring in Accounting and Business Administration. She has been with the Lee County Elections Office since April of 1989. Next to her, we have Commissioner John Manning, who graduated from Purdue University with a postgraduate studies degree in healthcare economics. As a commissioner for District 1, he represents the citizens of Boca Grande, Boquilia, Cape Coral, Captiva, Matlache, Pine Island, Sanibel, St. James City, and Upper Captiva. Next to him is Commissioner Tammy Hall, who has been a resident of Lee County for over 30 years. She has worked in the marketing field and has owned her own marketing consulting businesses, servicing local, regional, and international clients. Tammy was first elected to the Board of County Commissioners in November 2004. Next to her is Mr. Ken Wilkinson, who graduated from, the, from Florida Atlantic University in 1971 with a Bachelor's of Science degree from the College of Business and Public Administration. He has served as Lee County property appraiser since 1980. And lastly, but not least, Ms. Linda Doggett, graduate from Edison State College with an associate's degree in computer science and continued on for her bachelor's degree in management information systems at Hodges University. She has more than 27 years of leadership experience with the Lee County Clerks of Courts. Each panelist, as I said, will have 10 minutes. And once all of the panelists conclude their presentation, please feel free. This is an interactive forum, so please make sure you have your questions prepared. Thank you. Go ahead and proceed, Carmen. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, when when uh, President uh, McEnany was talking about the drilling down there, I thought it was a new dental school that had just expanded. <laughs> But uh, I do want to compliment you, Mr. President. I uh, had an opportunity to, of course, participate in the recent uh, ribbon cutting of the second building uh, and also the cafeteria course and uh, the additional rooms for your expanding student body. And just want to applaud how you reach out to the world uh, with a world-class education facility here and uh, certainly recognizing the needed uh, space for the uh, ESL program, the English as a Second Language. Um, and again, uh, also to uh, uh, extend my appreciation to Leonardo Garcia and, and what he does yeah, with his role in this community, uh, bringing uh, uh, international relations uh, fr uh, front and center uh, uh, to this community, and welcome to the folks from the Dominican Republic. Um, let me first start off by saying that that uh, I, uh, first of all, have been a, a public servant, not a politician, a public servant. There's a difference. Um, <laughs> I've been a public servant for going on 24 years as a commissioner, but long before serving as a county commissioner, this is where I hope that, that Candidates in the future uh, play a more pivotal role in a community before they run for office uh, because it really gives them a better understanding and, and, and allows them to have, feel the pulse of the community. Um, I was a little league coach, helped raise our son uh, with my wife Kristen here in this community, and longtime member of the Qantas Club of Downtown Fort Myers, getting involved in a lot of community based projects. And I think that really gives you a perspective when you finally have that opportunity to become an elected official, as I have uh, served in this community, as I said, for some 24 years. Um, Quite frankly, it was interesting. I first moved here with my wife in 1983, and I was hired as, as Lee County's first environmental planner, uh, along with a number of other planners, to completely rewrite the Lee County Comprehensive Plan because we were literally, Lee County was at the 11th hour of being designated as area of state critical concern. The county commissioners uh, did not take uh, seriously uh, compliance with the State Growth Management Act, and we needed to bring our comprehensive plan into compliance with the State Growth Management Act. So. A number of planners, including myself, helped rewrite the entire comprehensive plan, and we did bring it into compliance and actually ended up receiving the 
uh, Award of Excellence from the Florida Chapter of the American Planning Association for the best comprehensive plan in the state of Florida. Unfortunately, there was a gentleman that ran, uh, yeah, his campaign was Big Changes, Low Taxes. For those of you who might remember him, and he was elected in 1986, and everything that we had done in 83 and 84 to, to bring our conference plan of consistency, provide for the funding for infrastructure, roads, utilities, uh, um, uh, parks, libraries, uh, 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 emergency medical service, a law enforcement department that could protect our communities, was, was completely turned on its head in 1986 by this particular commission when he was elected. And unfortunately, uh, went back to the, the good old days of where it was uh, okay to just have rampant development uh, with no provisions for managing growth. And so uh, I decided as a planner, environmental planner, that certainly with that being the sentiment of the board, not really understanding the importance of managing growth, protecting our resources, our land and water resources, that my days were limited as a planner. So I decided, what the heck, I'm gonna run for county commissioner. I can certainly do a better job than those sitting on that board. And I did, and I was fortunate enough to get elected in 1988. Um, we eventually turned things around with regards to uh, bringing our conference supply plan back in compliance with the State Growth Management Act and uh, promulgating a lot of ordinances and regulations that actually have been the basis of the protection of our quality of life that we enjoy today. Um, I have to tell you that, that as a commissioner, a lot of people don't realize that at the local level, we really do affect your lives each and every day. I mean, we're the ones that build the parks, the libraries, provide uh, public safety support in terms of emergency medical service, uh, law enforcement protection. We're the ones that uh, build the airport, operate the airport, uh, in, in our other hand as a port authority, and so we have a tremendous impact on, on each and every uh, buddy in this community with regards to their livelihood and, and their quality of life. And so it's important, and this is really a timely uh, forum today, because civic engagement is absolutely critical to protecting our democracy. To be honest with you, since the U.S. Supreme Court ruling last year, um, where there's unlimited uh, funds that can be uh, collected by uh, super PACs, uh, solely for the purpose, not necessarily to support uh, their candidate that, there's, that uh, they would like to see in office, whether it's state or, or federal level, even local level, but actually to undermine and destroy that candidate's opponent with unlimited funds. Uh, it's important that people and the public get engaged in order to protect the public interest, because otherwise it's just going to be a very few individuals and special interests influence that's going to dominate the policy making decisions at the local, state, and federal level. So as a, as a public servant, I stay engaged with Kiwanis. Uh, I still stay engaged with organizations like uh, CRU, the Corsica Regional Ecosystem Watershed Land Trust that's helping protect uh, and acquire environment sensitive lands to protect our water supplies and our open space and keep this uh, Lee County a special place to live and, and, and work and retire. Um, I would submit to anyone that's interested in getting involved um, uh, in their community, uh, particularly here in Lee County, of course, you have all sorts of opportunities to attend the Lee Grows program, to learn about all our various departments and how the county operates, uh, to meet our department directors, county uh, administrators, uh, the county commissioners. You can certainly volunteer for the, uh, oh gosh, there's, there's, there's uh, the, for the Visitor Convention Bureau to help welcome the visitors from all over the world that uh, um, uh, travel to this uh, great uh, uh, county. Uh, you can get involved in Parks and Recreation helping to support providing interpretive uh, educational uh, uh, programming for the visitors to our parks and recreation uh, facilities. You can get involved in all sorts of, of organizations depending on what your interest is. And, and personally, I think that Lee Gross program is the way to go to get a handle on just what Lee County offers you and how you can get involved. So looking forward to the questions uh, at the end of uh, hearing from all the panelists. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Sharon Harrington, and I am Supervisor of Elections for Lee County. Uh, Carmen kind of gave you a little bit of my background, but I wanted to just kind of go over it a little bit, because one of her things that she wanted us to talk about was what motivated us to physically run for a particular office and, and want to get involved the way we are. But I have to kind of build up to how I got where I was supposed to be. Um, when I started in 1989, I was the fiscal officer. And what that means was, I took care of all of the finances. Um, at one time, our office used to be on the county payroll, on the county's accounts payable program. Everything that we did in the office had to go through the clerk of court's office that pays all the bills. When Felinda Young decided to run for that position, my predecessor, one of the things that she wanted to do was get in, have our own set of books, do our own payroll, do our own accounts payable, 
to kind of speed up the process and take the burden away from the county. And uh, that's exactly what she hired me to do. So I was there when we uh, set up our payroll and we did all of our poll worker payroll and everything on our own and paid our own bills. And it really did work out better for our vendors because we were able to turn those bills around a lot quicker and alleviate a lot of the burdens that the clerk of court's office had to do, especially when we have elections. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, so I started in 1989, and in 2002, uh, I was fortunate to be appointed as an assistant supervisor number <coughs> two. Uh, I handled one portion of the office, and one of the other gals handled the other. Um, in 2004, my boss decided that she was going to retire before her term was up. The terms are for four years, and um, she was having some personal issues with parents up in Michigan that were ill and grandkids that were growing up without her being involved in their life and she decided to step back from the position. So I, I, I applied for the appointment with five other um, individuals and I was very happy that I did get the appointment. That was in February of 2004. By August of 2004, I was second guessing what I did. Uh, we had a hurricane come through that was very close to Lee County, actually hit just a little bit north of us. But all of our islands sustained a lot of damage. Um, Sandbelt, Captiva, Pine Island, St. James City. We lost all of our polling locations two weeks before a primary election. And I thought, hmm, trial by fire, and it really was. But I have a great team. Um, my employees are just amazing. We have such uh, longevity with the employees that all we had to do is say, okay, this is what we need to get done, we've got it done. And that really inspired me to keep going and providing Lee County with uh, good elections without major problems. We had been through the infamous election of 2000 and came out really well on that one considering how everything else went. So I, I decided I wanted to keep that level of expertise going with the office and went ahead and ran in 2004 to keep it. I did win that election in 2008. I was unopposed, and of course, this is an election year. Hopefully, we will be unopposed again. <laughs> yeah. um, what I have to do is, like anybody else probably knows, is handle all the elections at the state, uh, federal, and local levels. Um, I am not required to hold municipal elections. A lot of people think that I am. Um, actually, my jurisdiction only goes as far as the county level and special districts. But the cities contract with me to go ahead and do their elections for them. That's Benita, um, uh, Sanibel, Cape Coral, Fort Myers. Uh, all of the cities contract with me. They don't want to go buy new equipment, train co-workers, train staff, and that sort of thing. So I'm basically a vendor for them, so I do hold their elections as well. Which means now we have elections every single year. Uh, prior to 2000, nobody really knew what a supervisor of elections was, let alone what we did. And if they did know, they thought it was every other year or every two years, we would have an election the rest of the time we were sitting with our feet on our desks. Um, that was never the truth, but now we definitely are not sitting around with our feet on our desks. It has become a very, very interesting profession. Sometimes it is not very friendly. It's uh, very contentious at times. But we are so, we feel so strongly about being able to provide open, honest, accurate elections every time we go to the polls. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a hiccup or two now and again, but we're carrying that tradition on and we've been very, very successful with it. Um, I have 30 full-time employees. And when I first started in 1989, we had about 161,000 registered voters. As of noon today, we had 368,000 registered voters. And back in 1989, I, I, I would wonder at some of the other counties, the big counties like Miami-Dade and Broward, and go, God, how do they handle over 300,000 registered voters? Well, now I, now I am one, so now I know how that works. But it, there again, it goes back to staff, it goes back to people in the community. We cannot do elections right now. It's not on the internet that you can't go to a kiosk in a mall somewhere and vote. We have to have people to help us. And that's where we're going to be reaching out to our 
communities again to help us with poll workers. I brought some brochures that talk about being a poll worker. And it's going to be very important for us to reach out, especially to our Hispanic community. They just got done doing the 2010 census. And of course, they're going to be changing all of the new lines and we'll be getting those out to everybody. Back in 2000, when they did the census, Lee County was so close to meeting the requirements of Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act that was passed in 1965 that requires jurisdictions to provide materials in an alternate language for their voters. We were very, very close. So my predecessor at that time called the Department of Justice and said, well, what should we do? Because they are the ones that oversee that particular piece of legislation. And they said, well, you're so close, you need to just go ahead and start doing it, which we did. We started using uh, Spanish on our ballots, but it wasn't a requirement at that time, so it was limited. After the 2010 census, of course, we all know that we have a lot more um, Spanish-speaking people in our area, and now it is mandated by law to provide everything that we would provide anyone else in, in Spanish. We are reaching out to um, the Spanish community. We need Spanish poll workers, people who can help us when we have somebody come into the polling location to vote that may have questions. We have uh, one person in each of our office is fluent in Spanish. However, my office is in the office on election day. We can't be out there in the poll workers. So we're, we're going to be reaching out in a lot of different events and hoping that we can get more Spanish-speaking people to be poll workers. And contrary to popular belief, everyone, they are not volunteers. They do get paid for their class, for their day, when they work elections. So it is a little, it's a token. It's, you're not going to get rich on it. You can't make a living on it, but we do pay you. And we're going to be reaching out to um, Hodges and, and their Hispanic um, Institute, especially to give us some leads so we can go out there and start talking to some of the folks and getting them uh, to get on board with us and help their own community. One other thing before I pass on the mic, I personally would like to see more qualified Hispanic candidates on the ballot. Yes. Thank you, Sharon. First of all, let me say that I really uh, and truly appreciate the opportunity to be with you this afternoon and uh, quite frankly, forums like this should be happening more and more across Lee counties so the voters can actually get educated as to what we re really do. Uh, my name is John Manning. I am a county commissioner. I represent District 1. We are elected at large, so we need to understand all of the issues throughout Lee County, whether they be in Pine Island or Alba or Estero. Uh, I'm the laid back one in the group, especially between Commissioners Judah and Paul over here who have double the energy that I do. So I just want to get that out on the record right now. Um, Carmen, one, one uh, thing I have to correct you on, I, I did go for postgraduate studies in healthcare economics at Purdue. And if you think Florida was flat, West Lafayette, Indiana was very flat. So, but I did graduate from Northeastern University and actually uh, went through a, a Bachelor of Science program in political science. Who knew, right? Anyway, we came down here uh, from Massachusetts after the blizzard of 78 and never went back. Uh, I asked my father-in-law, who was here for about 10 years, you don't have to shovel snow down here? And he said, no. He said, I'll be right back. So we came back down in 1979 and the rest is history. I was involved early in, in my civic life. I was a Cape Coral City Council member in 1982 and I spent two terms on that council uh, and uh, Joan Zerkowitz for those uh, who who don't, may not know him, was the mayor at the time. We had other younger uh, county, uh, rather city council members, uh, in, which was an anomaly in the, in the city of Cape Coral at that time, Maryland, if you remember. Uh, I got off of that uh, group and went back to uh, the private sector. I've been a corporate benefit consultant in a past life for 28 years. I've spent the last decade in, in consulting with uh, local governments in the state of Florida. I was appointed to my position in 1988 when some guy by the name of Porter Goss ran for Congress. I guess he was successful. He, he, he won that race and went on to bigger and better things. And uh, I was reappointed in July of 2010. Uh, 
Commissioner Bob James died in the middle of his uh, term. He was a great, great man. And uh, I was told, and I am a history buff, but I've never looked this up, that I'm the only person in the state of Florida who was ever appointed to a county commission by two different governors. I, I thought you can do a fact check on that, but somebody smarter than me told me that, so I, I appreciate knowing that. Anyway, the, the county commission, if I could describe it very easily, is the legislative body of the county. Uh, we create the laws which are called ordinances. Uh, we uh, also uh, are responsible for our budget, uh, which is quite substantial, although the budget that we uh, have under our control is actually only about 38 or 40 percent. Uh, correct me, colleagues, if, if I'm, I'm wrong there. A lot of people think we have a billion dollar budget that we control, and, and that's not really true. We have other constitutional officers that have their own duly created uh, budget, and the sheriff is a big part of that. Uh, in, at any rate, um, we have many issues that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, meetings seem to be the bane of the chair's uh, day, uh, and we do rotate the chair every year, uh, which is a good thing, because you get uh, a little insane uh, with long days and, and nights uh, doing this job. But it's, it's a great job. It's, it's one that uh, I enjoy very much because I'm passionate about local government. I want to echo something that Commissioner Judas started to allude to. Every year it seems that we play defense when it comes to the legislative process. Unfunded mandates are the bane of our existence, and we've got a few coming down uh, this year. Unfortunately, one is, is a Medicaid issue. Just so you know, in 2008, the late legislature created a new billing system for Medicaid patients, and it never worked. So now what they've done is they've taken our share of revenue sharing to the tune of about a million three next year, and it will be going to their coffers because they can't fix their system. Those are the types of things that we fight just about every year in the legislative session. Uh, most of the legislature, legislative folks have never ever been in local government. Uh, they don't quite understand it, and uh, that's my opinion, uh, and I'm sticking to it. And uh, we, we do want to work with them, but it's, it's very frustrating at times. But uh, county commission is, is the driver of the services that we provide in the county. Uh, and Ray alluded to it very well. And I, too, would suggest anyone who wants to get involved in understanding the nuts and bolts of county government to get involved in the grows. I believe, Ray, you and I were on board when that group started. And we, it was an experiment. and. Uh, it's worked very well, and, and the feedback that I have been getting from people in that program is unbelievable. They didn't know a lot about county government when they started. They know a lot more than they even want to know when they finish that course, and they're very grateful that uh, they went through it. So there are very many opportunities to volunteer and get involved civically. My number is 533-2224 district one at Lee County, Lee County, .com. Uh, Those are the ways that you can get uh, in touch with me. And I'd be very happy to sit down and, and go over some of these opportunities. But if you don't get involved, don't complain. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. ride your horse down the road to our bridgeless islands, our beautiful beaches, and everything in between. And we try very hard as we go out and we look at this really unique community we call Lee County to make sure that we're protecting each of those areas and making sure that we work very hard to retain a great quality of life so that no matter who you are, whether you are born in the United States 
whether you're a visitor from the U.S. or somewhere else, or whether you choose to want to look at Lee County to make this your home, you'll have options. You'll have a quality of life that we've all grown to love and call this wonderful place home. I'm from northern Wisconsin, a very small community called Eagle River. And I grew up owning my, uh, my parents, my grandparents owned a restaurant and a resort. So I grew up in the hospitality business. I, I, would, I would put money against anyone who has cleaned more bathrooms than me. Because uh, we had eight cottages, two bathrooms each, plus a, a, a restaurant. So there's a lot of cleaning. But you know, you learn a lot of responsibility and you learn to give back. Uh, as a small business owner in my community, I started my public service very young. Uh, when I moved here to Southwest Florida in 1978, I was 17 years old, and uh, immediately started to get back and get involved in the community. As Ray said, it's so important that when you want to come and serve your community, that you understand what is your community. I've had the privilege to serve on numerous boards, and it's not because people ask me, it's because I volunteered. Um, believe me, it, there's so many resources that we have in this community that we don't, we, we don't know all of, the opportunity. So when you come forward and say, um, if, you, if you need someone, I'm here, it's so helpful. But I've served on YMCA boards, I've served on the PACE board, I've served on Civic, like Edison Ford, I've served on the trauma, I'm serving on the trauma center uh, now with our regional uh, hospital, hospital and trauma area. Uh, the reason that I wanted to get involved in government wasn't because I had a burning desire to be an elected official. Uh, I started my own business in 1992, which is a marketing consulting firm, and one of my clients, who was uh, not from the United States, had a very heavy accent and wanted to meet with the mayor and the city councilman in Fort Myers. So when I made the appointment for him to come in and meet with these gentlemen, uh, they got frustrated with his accent and so picked up the newspaper and started reading the newspaper while he was in the middle of discussing the development that he wanted to do in downtown Fort Myers. Uh, it was a very big honor for him to come into our community and to have the opportunity to meet with elected officials. Depending on where you're from, uh, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. In America, we don't think so highly of our elected officials as many other countries do. And so this was a very important meeting. Uh, this gentleman was getting ready to invest quite a bit of money in the city of Fort Myers. I was absolutely horrified that my elected officials would treat anyone, no matter who you are, in this manner. Uh, when I left that appointment, I called to do my follow-up call and express my concern, and the flippant answer that I got pretty much said to me, you know, if you want to make a difference, you want to change, you want to complain, then you get involved. So I ran against the incumbent in 2000 and was uh, given the privilege to serve the city of Fort Myers from 2000 to 2004 as the representative for downtown, which I welcomed all folks who wanted to invest in our beautiful city <laughs> called Fort Myers. The county has five cities. We have the city of Sanibel, the city of Benita Springs, the town of Fort Myers Beach, the city of Cape Coral, and then of course Fort Myers. And as a county commissioner, we work with all five cities because these areas have incorporated, became cities, because they wanted to have a direction and a higher level of service, but to be more of the masters of their future. So they've drawn their boundaries, and we try to work with them jointly. Uh, on their area, but what we call the unincorporated area, which is what we oversee. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to serve you. Uh, we have five county commissioners, and as John said, we are all elected at large, which means I represent you no matter where you live in Lee County. My District 4, where I, I'm required to live, is North Fort Myers and Cape Coral, and part of downtown now, the change the lines, and East Fort Myers. When you serve the public, it isn't a 40 hour a week job. It is, becomes a part of you. Uh, wherever you go, whatever you do, people uh, would like to have a conversation with you. They wanna reach out, they wanna talk about what are the issues. Uh, sometimes it's very frustrating, especially when you're with your family, but it, it's, a, it's part of your soul and your, part of your commitment to your community. Just as if you were the president of the YMCA, everyone who sees you wants to talk about the YMCA. If you're a doctor, everybody wants to talk to you about your health. So it's, it's part of your job. It's part of, and for me anyways, uh, wanting to stay engaged, wanting to make sure that people know that you have access to your elected officials. I think one of the frustrating things when you're younger and you're coming up through and you're looking at politics and the people who are making the decisions on your behalf, whether you voted for them or not, is can I pick up the phone and call them? 
So I've worked very hard to make sure that my office is accessible. Uh, I always found it very intimidating to call elected officials. Uh, but, you know, they're always so warm and welcoming when they're running for office um, and not so available when they're in office. And um, I have to say that um, the colleagues that I'm uh, privileged to sit here with this afternoon are the ones that are warm and welcoming all year round, whether they're running for office or not. And that is certainly the type of public official that I strive to be. Uh, in 2004, I was given the honor and privilege to run for county commission. I had uh, five guys that I had to, you know, maneuver with. Uh, and fortunately, the voters of Lee County supported me and gave me the honor to serve uh, only as the third woman to ever be elected in Lee County. And now we're 125 years old, and the first woman in 2006 to ever serve as the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. And I've had the op opportunity to do that twice. So as you heard Sharon say, the diversification and getting out there and running, we certainly welcome the opportunity for candidates. Um, I've had more people come through my office when they're thinking of running for office. It doesn't matter whether I'm going to vote for you or not. I've always tried to keep an open door policy when people want to ask about being a candidate. What does it take? Sure, come on in and talk to me. It's not, I don't pick and choose uh, the candidates. I get to pick and choose my individual. But in the meantime, I try to keep my door open, uh, whether I'm supporting your opponent or not, if you want to just come in and ask questions. Because I think that's part of the process, is being able to learn and to understand what it takes. Because it's a very big, draining job to be a candidate. You have to raise money. Uh, in some cases, you go and knock on doors. In other cases, you're on forums. And it really is from morning till night. Public service is certainly a privilege, and it is a way of life. Um, it is difficult because in this day and age, we live in the fast media. So right now, what I'm doing right this second is probably going viral. <laughs> um, there's no chance. There's no chance to catch up. And it becomes exhausting. And I fear, as I look at candidates who are coming forward and people who are looking or thinking to run, their fear of the exposure and the, the intrusion into your personal life, into your family's lives. Um, I hope that all of you that are here this afternoon will encourage your friends, uh, your associates, to consider public service. Yes, it is intrusive, and yes, there are lots of obstacles, but it is so rewarding, and it is such a privilege. And once you're here, you have to know a little bit about a lot of things. But get your support, um, and I see McGill. McGill has uh, jumped into the candidates for me. You know how challenging it can be. You really need to have that support around your family and your friends, but you can't win if you don't try, and losing isn't a loss, it's another opportunity. Uh, I certainly welcome uh, the questions that you'll have for us, but uh, again, as a, a county commissioner, uh, as a, a Spaniard who has had an opportunity to um, serve in this public community, to be elected at large, uh, I welcome uh, all of you to consider running for public office, and I hope that uh, you'll stop by my office and ask how I can help you. And in the meantime, I look forward to your questions, and thank you for giving us our, our 10 minutes to chat with you this afternoon. Thank you. You can see why I'm sorry that uh, Tammy had to go or got out of the congressional race because I think she would have added an awful lot to the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would have to say I'm the old man up here at the panel. I've uh, held this office since 1980, which actually makes me the longest serving elected official in the county. I'm not so sure if it's because I'm doing such a great job or who would want the job. <laughs> when, you, when you consider the property appraiser's office, we're, you know, thought of, the perception is that uh, we're responsible for everybody's taxes. And so I'm kind of like the tax man, and it comes with our job to explain uh, the values, etc. cetera, but we don't necessarily do the taxes. So let me give you a little background. Uh, I arrived in Florida with my mother and my four other siblings in 1954. Probably before many of you were even born, I hate to say, but true. And settled over in Lake Worth, Florida, went to public school, went to college, but uh, my family didn't have much money, so I ran out of money in my sophomore year. And it was the time that uh, Uncle Sam was calling a lot of young men, and I ended up in service for four years, one year in Vietnam. But it gave me the ability to come back and go to work, or go to school, on the GI Bill. So yes, it took me nine years to get a four-year degree, but uh, four of those years I spent in the military, and it was a great experience for me. It really taught me some leadership. It 
taught me how to take orders, and as you anywhere else, if you move up in the ladder, you, you learn to, to give the orders as well. So I would never turn uh, that experience back. So I think it really made a ground for myself uh, in future uh, endeavor. But I, you know, we came here in um, Lehigh Acres, actually, in the early 70s. Uh, we had two sons by then, and uh, got involved in civic stuff, and that's the way all of us have talked about, because that's how you get into your community. And we established the first swim team out in Lehigh, and I was Pop Warner, President of Pop Warner, my boys are football players, and they're also baseball players. I've been with their coach all through those years, and I've always been involved with sports because that's what my sons like to do, and the more time you can spend with your boys, and if any of those out there who know what I'm talking about, I'm sure you do, it's a phenomenal thing. The job of property appraiser is different than most uh, in local government. I think primarily because there's uh, more misunderstanding and more misconceptions about what are the duties and responsibilities of the local appraiser's office. Uh, it is a constitutional office. It is separately elected. In most states, they're appointed. I like the fact that in Florida, the 67 appraisers, one for each county, are separately elected because they're beholding taxpayers, the property owners, the voters, as opposed to a county manager that you have to keep them happy to keep your job. And uh, if you know my history at all in this county, you probably know the county manager would have fired me years ago. <laughs> I, I am kind of known to go out there on my own and, and establish and start things, that, but I've always believed in things that I've done, so I never have any regrets that way. But I am happy that this office is separately elected as opposed to being appointed different allegiance then. Uh, the, the normality of the duties is why I brought a couple of brochures. I hope you take the time because you never have enough time to go over. Uh, people don't realize Lee County is the uh, fourth largest county out of 67 in separate ownerships of real estate. There's Dave, Broward, Palm Beach, then Lee. And the property appraiser every year, by law, must reevaluate every property as to what the market indicates it's worth on January 1st of every year using the prior 12 months market data that's out there uh, that the public actually establishes the value by buying and selling property. We record it, we report it, and then we give that those numbers over to the taxing authorities. We think of the county as the taxing authority, certainly the school board in different cities and the township or Fort Myers Beach. But in effect, we have 91 different taxing authorities in Lee County, more than any county in the state of Florida. Now, every one of those authorities depend on the property appraiser's office to tell them what their values are every year so they can start their budget process. So they have the responsibility, once we give them the numbers of what the values are in their jurisdiction, and they have to come up with a millage. A mill is one dollar per thousand of taxable value. So if they have an X budget, they do the math, they tell our office what millage to apply to the new values to raise the dollars to fund their budget on an annual basis, and then I turn that information over to the tax collector, and they have the responsibility to send out the bill. I think the Office of Property Appraiser probably, and I'm convinced it is, has a a lot of accountability and I'm all for that. There's not another office in government, local, state, or federal that actually is required annually to mail you a personal letter and tell you what we've done to you. <laughs> it comes with a job. And we're also the dummies that put our names on it and tell you to come call us. <laughs> in the sense that it is accountability. It's a phenomenal process. I don't know any other government that has this, and it's great for our community, because every year when you get your notice, you have the opportunity, if you're not happy with the value that our office has put on your property, to contact us. We encourage you to do that. Lee County has the lowest percentage of those that go into that process and follow a petition if they're not satisfied with our answers, but you get an independent hearing before a private appraiser from private industry that sits in judgment of our work. And we also have the lowest percentage that are reduced. We're very proud of that record. Uh, uh, one of the questions in the handout that we got before we came here was, you know, what encouraged you, you know, Mr. Wilkinson, to want to get involved as county property appraiser? But frankly, uh, 
when I finally, after nine years, got a college degree, and uh, I went to work in banking, and uh, was a bank examiner for the state of Florida, and I came to Lee County as a senior vice president of a bank, and I left banking and went on my own to establish a stock market license, real estate, uh, insurance, and trying to be a jack of all trades was pretty tough raising a couple of kids. But I got involved and it was also a fee appraiser. Worked for an MNI local here in Fort Myers. What got me involved was the frustration with local government, specifically the property appraiser's office. Since I'm 67, I, I don't, I don't uh, make too many disparaging remarks on my predecessor who was 80 because I'm getting close, but he was 80 at the time and had a whole different thought process and wasn't up to what technology was even back then. It was strictly pencil. So from there, my frustration arose because I couldn't get the information from local government that I had to have to make a living for my family. I wasn't salaried. I worked on a commission. Unfortunately, many people in those days thought that government, those individuals, own those records. We don't own those records. We're custodians by law. So I felt very strongly about that. And it's why, from that time of being elected first in 1980, I don't know if you ever visit our website, legal.org, but we're very proud of that. And probably stacks up as number one, not just in Florida, the nation, but internationally. We have jurisdictions that come here and want to see how we've accomplished many of the things we've done. Otherwise, as far as doing what the law requires, the property appraiser doesn't have a lot of flexibility when it comes to value, certain specific methodologies we have to use. Then it comes down, there's four things that I believe anybody in the audience, anybody can apply in their life, in their workforce. If you want to run a good office, private or public, very, very easy. You hire the smartest people you can find because they make you look good. It's amazing. The number of people I know that don't follow that. You could be dumb as a box of rocks, but if you hire only smart people, you're going to look smart. <laughs> Train and educate them. When I took office, there wasn't anybody in our office that had a professional degree, college degree, let alone a professional as a MEI appraiser or appraiser. 70% of our office now has professional designation. Information technology. Get the best technology available in whatever job you do, and you'll be successful. You know what the fourth thing is? Get out of their way. Don't micromanage. I believe in one minute management. Tom Peters, you walk around, I walk to the office every day, mid morning, they know the sound of my feet, trust me. And, uh, you know, just to see, find somebody that's doing something right and tell them in front of their peers. That's the best thing they can hear that day. If you see somebody's not doing their job correctly, you don't embarrass them from their peers, but you go to the supervisor. That's, that's what all it takes to run a good office. That doesn't mean all of it, I want you all running from my office. <laughs> <laughs> now, one other, a couple of quick things, I think I have two more minutes. Uh, yes, I have certain responsibilities, and they are hard, but I also am a very em empathetic person. And I've been able to, in fact, I can say, uh, I think without any, any question, that I have, as, as a citizen, changed the state constitution more than any other individual in our state history. There's three, three ways you can do that. You can do it by citizen's initiative. I've done that to save our homes, because in the 80s, people were being literally forced off their property because of rising taxes. So we were able to put together a citizen's initiative, get over three quarters of a billion signatures, passed it in ballot in 92. So in Florida, no longer a homesteaded property cannot go up more than 3% a year taxable value. It's benefited many of our residents. Later on, it became obvious that we were trapping people in their home because they couldn't move because we voted. So when you move, your value came back to market. So then we had again changed the constitution and allowed for portability. So now in Florida, you Take that savings with you if you transfer within Florida into homestead. Uh, the latest, like I said, there's three different ways you can do it. Citizens, I've done it. I've done it by writing the language of portability. And also, uh, every 20 years, our governor, Senate President, and Speaker of the House 
appoint 25 of our citizens out of how many million citizens might be eligible. I'm proud to say the governor asked me to sit on this commission that only meets every 20 years that can put issues directly on the ballot in our state. We were able to recognize another problem that some segments were having in our population, and that's working water from people in Florida because of rising values, ergo rising taxes. They were being taxed based on highest and best use for these little small mom and pop four or five generation marinas here in Lee County and all over the state. They couldn't stay on that land and produce what they did in their business and pay the taxes. So we were able to get another issue on the ballot that passed at 72 percent that for now on beginning in 2008 working waterfront would be evaluated on current use. And what was happening is people were valuing that property as condominiums because that's what it was worth. And that was forcing these people off of their property that they've been there for generations. That passed and no longer can that happen. It will be evaluated on the income that that property produces. But we've been very fortunate uh, in being involved civically, I'm encouraging people to do that. Like Tammy, I've always had an open door policy. I've got some great stories I can tell you. I'm a doctor that calls me from St. Louis on Sunday, and I say, hey, doc, I got office hours, you know, things like that. Or a lady calls me from Tampa on the weekend. She says she can't find her lot in Cape Coral. I said, lady, there's people who live in Cape Coral that can't find their lot. <laughs> can you find your lot? Good. In, in closing, it's been a phenomenal career. I, I really enjoyed this because I've been doing this for more than 30 years. I've got 38 years of public service. There can't be a better vocation in my mind. One quick thing, I've been concerned for the last 30 some years that the public perception of public employees is so wrong. But what we will read about public employees is always going to be the negative. Trust me. The Lord did not look down at birth and say, look at that reject, we'll put him in government. The Lord put him everywhere. The, the Lord didn't look down at my birth and say, look what Mr. and Mrs. Wilkinson made. He's so screwed up, we'll really fix you, we'll elect him. So what I'm saying is, it's, it's, a, it's an honorable service, and I don't want anybody to get into it. If you want to come talk to me, like Pammy says, Ray, all of us are the same way in that way. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now that Ken Wilkinson has woken everyone up, everyone's wide awake now. <laughs> I'm Linda Doggett, and I am not currently the elected official for the clerk's office. Charlie Green is still our elected official. He couldn't be here today. He is, has announced his retiring, that he is retiring and he's endorsing me uh, to run, and I'm running currently for this office. But I'm here to tell you about the clerk's office and why I'm interested in running for the office. And I'm a little bit unlike the other um, folks here at the table. I have worked for the clerk's office for close to 28 years. And I'm interested now in this office because I have been there and been able to see the great opportunities um, that are available by being really committed to doing a great job, low cost services, great service to the customers. And for the clerk's office, everyone is our customer. Board of County Commissioners, Commissioners is our customer. Um, the courts are our customer. The like citizens are our customers. Everybody, we're, you know, we're in customer service basically, and our job is um, information and customer service um, because we are responsible for all of the financials for the for the board for the county we have over 2,000 folks um, in the county that use our financial systems um, we keep the public records for the citizens so all of the records that are recorded in this county come to our office we are the clerk to uh, the courts, so all of the court case files and all the financials related to those case files and all the dispositions, all of that information goes through our office and we support the courts um, in that capacity. 
we are an internal auditor for the county and we keep uh, the minutes of the board meetings. So as you can see, we provide a lot of service and we have a lot of information. And because of that, um, very clerical, we keep a lot of information. So for us, and my background, as you heard, is technology. For us, it makes sense to do, to do um, automation projects, to have automation um, for everything that we do. And that's really where I've seen the opportunities over the years um, in the clerk's office. And I want to see that continue. There's so much, so much savings to the taxpayer um, by automating records. And we're record keepers. We keep tons of records. And we, um, in public records, now we don't keep any paper. And we used to have rooms and rooms full of paper. And I, I think, um, our supervisor of elections alluded to the fact that our financial system was very cumbersome in the old days. Um, <laughs> our public records was very cumbersome way back in the 80, early 80s. And that's why our current elected official, Charlie Green, ran for office. He was in the title business. He had to wait close to a month for something to get recorded in the public records. It's ridiculous. So he took office and he said, we have to do this better. And then he hired smart people. <laughs> <laughs> like me, okay, came with a technology background and said, we need to have everything electronic. And that, that takes, not only does that take smart people in, um, in that field, but it takes leadership and cooperation, it takes collaboration with all of the other offices that we work with. And that's one of the reasons um, that I'm in the position I am, I am the Chief Operating Officer. I have worked one of the first projects that I did was to collaborate with the county on implementing a new financial system so that we are now completely electronic. We, we, we pay our bills all electronically. We don't have any paper in our system. All of our payment of um, all the accounts payable is all workflow. We don't have paper. Everything is, um, invoices come in electronically. They get routed to someone electronically. So we don't have any paper and everything is very efficient now and all the information that we keep in that financial system is available immediately. Uh, we have systems that allow us to pull information, whatever questions are being asked at the time so that the commissioners can make better decisions. That, that information can be pulled immediately out of our electronic systems for budget reasons, for decisions about what we should change, about new laws, anything that you need information the clerk's office has that information, and that's our goal is to make it available, make it quick, make it, you know, so that you can use it. There's no sense in having it if you can't use it. Um, and same thing for the court system. I, would, I went from technology into the courts, and same goal. We needed to automate the records that we held for the courts, and we have done that. Everything we hold is electronic. Um, we have saved probably close to a million dollars. Actually, we have a study that, that shows that we've saved a million dollars um, operationally just in the court system by going to electronic records. And we still have a lot of things left to do there. We can still automate some of the, the paper processes that we have today, and we are working on those processes, and we work collaboratively with the judges on that. And that is going very well, and we think within the next year or two that we'll have paperless courtrooms and we'll save another five hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm. And that saves I mean, it saves you money and it not only it saves you money, but it makes the whole system better. It functions better. The cases um, you know when somebody sits and gets arrested and sits in the jail, it costs you money as a taxpayer. And what needs to happen is that that person needs to get to first appearance within 24 hours. But if the information isn't available to the attorneys in a timely fashion, those things don't happen timely and that person sits in that jail and costs money. And so our big objective is we have worked with the courts, we have worked with the jail, we've worked with Mike Scott, we've worked with everyone involved, the state attorney, the public defender, we all work collaboratively to make the system work better, faster, more efficiently, so that so that we can be efficiently be efficient overall and, and not only save money but do a better job of, of what we do, of dispensing justice, of you know, all of 
the and the clerk's office has all the fees and fines, the responsibility of collecting fees and fines related to the court system. And I will tell you, if you are interested at all in doing anything legislatively, um, you should go out there and try to simplify that process. That is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it's very crazy and it's, you know, I, I think we just oftentimes spin our wheels because we just have a lot of laws that the unintended consequences create a lot of a lot of unproductive work on the on the, uh, the benefit you know from the from your local offices and, and that could be I think you know, a lot of improvement can happen. Um, we do we run the jury we for the courts so we we are get selected for jury duty we pull the jurors in. Um, that's another thing that is very important in the court system. If you want to do something, show up for jury duty. <laughs> we like it when that happens. Um, but our website contains all the information for everything that we do. All the financial information is represented on our website. Um, if, if you're interested in some of the topics that go before the Board of County Commissioners, and I have a lot of respect for the tough decisions that they have to make, financial information is available on our website that helps them make their decisions and it would help you if you wanted to go before the board and make comments so that they, they know where you stand and what your concerns are. A lot of information is on our website for you to use. We have, and we don't run these programs, but they are run by the courts. There's a guardian ad litem program that's very valuable to our community um, that you could always look at uh, volunteering your services in that area. Um, again, I am and I'm, I'm in that office every day, and I am open to any suggestions. Um, I, I listen to everyone's suggestions. We improve our systems. We improve our processes every day. We take thousands of statutes and rules and regulations, and we mold those into processes and procedures. Uh, the 350 to people to follow every day to do the right things for the right reasons. We do our best. We're not perfect. We, again, have thousands of you know, statutes and laws that we follow. And so, um, you know, we do our best, and I think we do a great job. We've been very responsible. We've reduced our uh, workforce. When our when our workload goes down, we reduce our workforce. When our workload goes up, we try and automate more. Because we want to keep our costs down and we want to keep our services up, and that's what we do. Um, and that's why um, I really want to run for this office, because I really believe that these things are important. And because I've been involved in the process, I see those opportunities firsthand. And I think they're very, very important, and I really am very passionate about it. Business to business, and then ultimately consulting in the local government arena. Uh, I was asked to submit paperwork in 2010 to get back into uh, this seat uh, by the incumbent who was in the office in 2009. In July, I did that not knowing uh, the gravity of the health situation that lay ahead of uh, Commissioner James. Mm. And um, fate would have it, I'm, I'm back here again and up for re-election this year to a full four-year term. So my, my, my way of getting back involved in local government was very different. Um, I've also served on some statewide boards as past president of the Florida Association of Counties. And once you get back at that level, they put you on every board conceivably that they can think of that you might want to serve on. So um, that's kind of my way of getting back into the local arena. Um, when I, most of my career was spent in downtown Fort Myers, so I was very isolated from the county as a whole. I didn't really go outside of that area. And being as young as I was serving on different boards, I really stayed very focused on those meetings and then go back to work. I work for a large architectural and engineering firm here in Lee County. Um, so running for city council was very different because it's a district race, so only the people in District 1 will vote for you. But having all of my experience being in downtown where no one lives, the incumbent had, was born and raised in Fort Myers, was a dentist, was very well known, and so I and couldn't raise any money. Nobody would give me a check because they didn't want to upset the incumbent. So I literally, every uh, weekend, I would take my bike and 
sit on one end and uh, walk the neighborhood this way, walk this, take the bike over the next. So I knocked on about 780 doors to introduce myself to the voters because they had no idea who I was. And, and why should they? Um, because I'd never engaged in that. And so I was, um, I didn't win outright. At that time, we still had runoffs in 2000. So, um, and there were, I think there were three or four of us in that race. So none of us got the 51% of the votes. Of the incumbent and I had a runoff in the general, and I did beat him. Not by much, but I, I did beat him. And I think it's that hard work. When I ran for county commission, nobody thought I could win. As a matter of fact, they thought I was taking a step that was bigger than me. And there were a lot of people who said, what, who are you? You know, what are you thinking? You know, who is this girl? And um, there was not a lot of support out there. And I, I really had to go out and reach out to folks. But again, I think that if you're committed, and let me make it really clear to you, because I've, I've had to make a tough decision to back off a congressional race. Not because, and, and people are saying that too, who is this woman? Aren't you getting a little bit of your riches? No, I'm not. And, um, but it was a personal choice. And it wasn't because I couldn't raise money. It wasn't because I couldn't campaign. If you're going to get in a race and I'm going to take your money, then you better be in at 110%. You better be willing to sacrifice day and night, stay on that campaign trail, and do your job. Because you're asking people to write a check to you, and these times you got to be really serious. For me, I, I couldn't give 110% um, physically and emotionally. I just couldn't give 110% to the, that race and still be a county commissioner and still do my uh, business that I have. So I felt that um, this was a race that had great people in it, and um, voters had good choices. But I think if you don't know anyone and you're not in that inner circle, you got to have tenacity. And because you won't raise as much money as the other guy, and you're going to have to work twice as hard. And you're going to have to work twice as hard if you're, um, and, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but you are going to have to work twice as hard if you're a woman. You are going to have to work twice as hard if you're a minority. But it's not impossible. We've seen it over and over in Cape Coral in uh, our judgeships, which, my goodness, those folks came in advertised um, in, uh, in a lot of our races. So if you're the right candidate, you have the right message, this community wants good people. Uh, but it is tough. It's harder, without a doubt. Commissioner Judah, and then. Yeah, if I may, uh, that's a really good question because I want everyone in this room and anyone out there in the community that has the desire uh, and, and, and the sense of purpose to to run for office, to, to feel that they have an opportunity truly to, to win the seat they're running for. And, and I appreciate what, what I've heard from you know, Commissioner Manning and, and Commissioner Hall. It, it requires a tremendous commitment um, in, in physically uh, and, and mentally. And, and I would submit that it doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. Um, if you're willing to, to roll up your sleeves, if, if you're willing to, to walk the neighborhoods, uh, it, you, you can accomplish your goal to, to be elected as an elected official here in, in this community and anywhere else in this country. I can just give you my own personal example is that when I ran in 1988, I didn't have the money and I knew I wasn't going to raise the money to be able to pay the filing fee. And so I went out and collected signatures to get on the ballot, which is another option in order to get on the ballot. It also forced me to have to get beyond my inner um, circle of, of, of comfort um, to go out there and ask people from all over the county if they would at least just sign a petition to allow me to get on the ballot. And then they could judge me once I am in the middle of the campaign. But give me that opportunity. And ever since then, I've actually uh, limited my campaign contributions to no more than $100 from any individual corporation. I haven't adjusted for inflation. Um, I mean, this, is, this has gone on since 1992 with, with limiting my contributions, and you can actually take in at least $500 from any individual corporation. But I felt strongly enough that, that somebody needed to exercise some kind of campaign reform because as I spoke up earlier with what went on with the, the Supreme Court decision last year and the, the obscene amount of money that's, that's in these campaigns now, um, I just wanted to point out time and time again that even when I've had opponents that have outraised me because of my limitations, quite frankly, the incumbency is a liability these days. It's not, it's, it's not a, a, a guarantee that, that you're going to have an easy go of it. Um, really, you already have one mark against you just because you're, you've been in office and you have a track record. But I would submit it's not the time in office, it's the performance and productivity that hopefully people will judge you on. Uh, there's some, you know, 
depending where you are in, in your career, but if you're a young person and you want to get involved, I know uh, one thing that I count on that really helped me was knowing you have to do a lot of speaking. And so I joined the JCs, and in fact, it's President JC there, but they have this program called Speak Up JC, and you enter state competition. Speaking is the uh, scariest thing for all in individuals, and you have to really work at it. But that helped me tremendously get involved with the Chamber of Commerce. As far as politics, I think the best thing I did, I had two young sons, I put t-shirts on and said, vote for my dad. We, and we walk the precincts. You can get walking lists from Sharon's office, and it will identify the household. If it's a Democrat, Republican, or mixed, and then uh, if they vote or don't. So you don't waste your time standing in front of public because you minimum one out of ten, can't, or max, will you reach that might end up voting. So uh, budget your time is as important as anything. Uh, I'm like Ray, I've always set a limit on my contributions, it's 500 for every, uh, did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Max. <laughs> you know, anybody's in fine. <laughs> All right. We have another question here, Reverend Swyth. Practically, it's not a question. It's my respect to each one of you. No, thank you. I've been in the area for the last 34 years, I see so many county commissioner change, and I see a lot of administration change. And for myself, today is coming to be educated because now I know more about your portfolio, your responsibility, and I'd like to say that I find out that that I do now. It's been the job. Mm. The time. Uh, we use around the country. And you see how government work and so many people doing wrong things behind the community responsibility that give you because I feel you have a responsibility, and you carry that respect when the community appointing you to be working to defend different issues. And let me tell you, uh, I respect you. You're doing a, a tremendous job. I see it. I work with each one of you. And I see the way uh, you respect and I have really accept what they said before. We need people into the Spanish community. Mm. And that's going to come. This is going to come. Not that we never see a Spanish official in Cape Cora or in Lee County. The community give the Spanish community the privilege to select one time a county commission in Spanish. Cape Cora give up the privilege to select a city council. I mean, it's not that, uh, it's not that, uh, uh, that the Spanish is not there because nobody wants to select them. It's an open field. And I, and I will see your encouragement to the Spanish community, select somebody, for somebody that carry a respect and carry education to, to be working, to represent in the, 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 the Spanish community and the community in whole. But let me tell you, uh, we're working, and you're going to see people Spanish. We're going to push people to the, to the arena. And you're going to see it. You have to understand that after the census, we're not no more minority. We're not no more. Now, to us now is to try to educate people to get responsibility. But let me tell you, I respect you and I love you. <laughs> and you're doing a tremendous job. You have a clean government, 
and that's what I take. That's what I take. But take good people who want to be office officials to do the job and, and move on. So thank you, and I'm really sorry. Uh, we do have some hands raised. The county commission does not have specific policies. That is not our jurisdiction. That would be in the domain of the state legislature. And if you ever try to lobby the House or the Senate on any issue that's important, especially to local government, it's like pushing a boulder up a very steep hill with your bare feet, and it's 98 degrees up. So it's a little difficult. Um, Tuitions, my understanding is the legislature tried very diligently to increase tuitions at the state universities. This being a private university, I'm not sure what the exact policy would be. But from the county's perspective, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, uh, we do not have the jurisdiction to raise or lower uh, public university tuitions. like to say that um, we don't set policy and the clerk's office certainly doesn't set any policies um, we pretty much follow those statutes but we've taken the position that it's our responsibility to reduce our costs so that that taxpayer money can be used for things like education which is very valuable in our community and, um, and that's pretty much the extent of what we can do but we take that very seriously you know the heard that, that it's the state legislature has jurisdictional oversight with regards to the funding for our state university system. What you need to also understand is that the state constitution dictates or states that uh, the legislature provide adequate and sufficient funding for the state university system. But it's the very state legislature that interprets what is adequate and sufficient. And therein lies the problem because it has been inadequate and insufficient for years. I mean. Florida schools are in the bottom quartile uh, in the nation with regards to funding per capita, no matter what level of schooling you're talking about. And I would submit what the legislature needs to do is recognize that we're not an income tax state. We all know that. We rely on property tax, we rely on sales tax, primarily. And if the legislature would look at the $25 billion in sales tax exemption that they grant year in and year out to special interest groups and organizations and individuals to pare down and actually decrease the sales tax in this state, we would bring in more revenue to help pay for quality education. Carmen, next question. Hi, I have a question. With the current budget deficits and problems, what's going to happen to the human services program? Yeah. Funding cuts. Funding cuts. Um, we have right now in our general fund approximately working towards eliminating a $30 million deficit, which affects our human services. Human services budget, if you correct me, it's about $21 million, and I believe $15 million comes from the general fund, the balance of that are grants, federal and state grants that we get. Um, all of that's gonna be affected. We, we set a goal three years ago to have our expenses and our revenues come into line in three years. Uh, but what we've done is we've lowered taxes every year. So we've taken, even though we could roll up to take in the same amount, because everyone, all of us have a story of someone, whether our family or friend, who is so challenged right now, the 
Board of County Commissioners haven't raised fees, nor have they raised taxes. They've lowered every year, which means we're not working towards that deficit. What we've been hitting that deficit with is cuts, cuts, cuts. We're down to, um, we just had uh, two more layoffs this week uh, in another department, but we have to get down to some serious cuts to be able to, able to do that. The only other choice, if we don't do that, is to raise taxes. So, you know, if you spend this much and you're not making that much, reserves are only going to last us maybe another three years, and then we're going to have to deal with that. And, and, and I think that the challenge that a lot of people have when we talk about raising taxes, we haven't raised the millage, so people think we haven't done anything. But by the fact that we haven't raised the millage and property values have gone down, we have, in a sense, given you a tax break. I could leave the millage the same and property values go up, which in turn is a tax increase. So the idea that we're not changing the millage, it just, into some cases, people say, oh, they haven't raised taxes. Well, that's not true. You have to really look at what our income is that year. So I don't know directly how they're going to affect human services. We have a, a grant program called Partnering for Results. And 15% last year, I think we reduced that by 15%. We're one of the few counties in the state that still has such a um, incredible grant program. It's a tough grant program, but it, it is, and it's a very accountable grant program. So we're not really sure yet. We're going into budget this spring, and then we'll have a better answer for you. But we're very committed to recognizing that the challenges that this community is facing, we play a role in being a safety net to some degree. Mm. So I don't think that there's three votes on this board to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But at the end of the day, we have an obligation for a balanced budget. And I applaud my colleagues. We don't pillage our funds. We keep them directly. So we don't borrow from Peter to pay Paul. We don't uh, take one uh, time uh, cash infusions to pay for ongoing expenses. Uh, we are a very conservative, uh, very fiscally responsible county government. And I want to thank my colleague, Commissioner Judah. Uh, Commissioner Manning came on board these last couple of years, but that has been a tough battle for us not to take all the recommendations that so many people want to give us to do the wrong thing. And I think our commitment to keeping county government stable financially has kept our, our A bond rating and has kept us in a position to blend this deficit over time versus having to just cut off our arm and say no to everyone, but to do it slowly and still painfully, but do it in a way that is not impacting the people who need us the most right now. Just very quickly, I think the Commission over the years has been very innovative when it comes to human services, the provision of human services. In effect, if you were to do an audit of some of the major programs in human services, they actually save the taxpayers money. Mm -hmm. uh, the triage center, uh, pretrial diversion systems mm -hmm. uh, that keep um, non-harmful felons, if you want to call them that, out of the court, uh, the jail system, uh, which is very, very costly and, and very expensive, not only to build and to run. So we have to be very careful on what programs that we uh, not only invest in, but, but we have to look at from an investment standpoint of view and what our return on investment is. Uh, my view is to keep those programs going that save the taxpayers money in the long run uh, in a couple that I just alluded to there. And uh, this board has been uh, a staunch supporter of human uh, services in light of a very significant recession. And we've been one of the parts of the country, as you know, that has been hit the hardest in both uh, the construction industry and the real estate market. If you can find somebody uh, working uh, in construction uh, in Lee County in 2012, let me know. I'd like to shake his or her hand. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, for the benefit of everybody here, I don't know that everybody here knows what Lee Gross is. And if somebody can, one of you or two of you can shed some light from that, some light on that. Um, and also, it's my perception that it's predominantly held during the daytime. Is there a possibility that it could uh, at some point be held later on in the day or accommodate a greater, uh, greater uh, number of people that can attend? Well, first of all, I was very proud to be on the board with my colleague, Commissioner Judah, when Lee Groves was created. 
And it's a program for people who wish to really get a good understanding of what county government is all about. And it's a multi-week program. Uh, there was actually a graduation ceremony. Um, and at the end of it, they, they asked the chairman or a representative for the board to come over and to speak to them and answer questions. But it looks at specific departments, it looks at budgetary issues, it looks at the nuts and bolts of what Lee County is all about, Lee County government. And it gets very detailed, it gets very, very systemic in terms of what, not only what we do, but what our employees do all throughout the system. Uh, you go to the constitutionals are involved in this as well, uh, and uh, it's soup to nuts, A to Z. Uh, it's a very, very encompassed program, and I would really, really suggest it. Uh, we've been getting rave reviews over the years about that. Uh, the second part of the question was again. Oh, okay. We, we do have public hearings uh, in the evening uh, twice a month. Oh, Lee Groves, I'm sorry. A lot of people yes, yes, and you're right, and we've discussed that in the past, and I discussed that the other day after one of the meetings, because most of the, the people who go through there are retirees, and I think it would be very, very good of us to at least have one or two classes per year that were strictly for those people who work, so I agree with you on that 100%.
the discussion with Commissioner Hall and then. Well, I'll just share with you, uh, Green Gallon Solutions is a firm that is already producing ethanol from Greece. Uh, they're in North Fort Myers. They're um, right now producing a million gallons uh, and they're expanding now. And they, that, that, those, that ethanol sold. And they did so well before they were open, they're now expanding to do three million gallons. Uh, you have the solar field at FGCU, which is powering just right there on the campus. You have the proposed floor power and light solar field that's coming up in Babcock, but their actual transmission will come from North Fort Myers up to that, so it'll get on the grid. So there's a lot going on in renewable energies. And um, Carmen, is it Dr. Um, Simmons? Yes, yes. Simmons sure. at, at Florida Gulf Coast University would welcome a call from you. Um, and if you give your card, uh, let me introduce Carmen Sullivan, who's my executive assistant. Thank you, Carmen, for coming. <laughs> To, uh, your project, Carmen, will we'll put you and do an introduction for you so that you can see what's happening on the front lines there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. A question over here? I, I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Ann Nocher. I'm a professor of communication here at Hodges, so can great plug on the public speaking thing. I have students here. I really appreciate that. I'll get you your $500 check later. <laughs> but I'm kind of wondering about something that happened uh, relatively recently that has something to do with property taxes and valuations. I believe it was Proposition 1 where some somehow property taxes were re not repealed but rolled back in a way I believe that has affected like our fire and paramedic services and police services could you could you clarify why that happened and exactly what sure. have we seen has, has this affected our for instance social services budget down uh, the line not not really bottom line it wouldn't Proposition 1 came out of Tallahassee, but it was the TBRC, which I served on, Tax and Budget Reform Commission, and uh, we were able to put issues directly to the ballot. What that did, it added a second 25000 exemption. It also allowed for the portability where you could take the cap with you. The argument over the years in, in throughout the country and the world when it relates to agricultural property tax is you know, every exemption admittedly benefits a certain amount of people and others feel it doesn't benefit them. The criteria that I've always used in my involvement with exemption has been for the greater good mm -hmm. because there are people like the working waterfront I talked about mm -hmm. uh, that are hurting and in the case of Saver Homes uh, it, it had to do with people who were being literally for forced off their property and they weren't creating it it was because the law in Florida is when you arrive here what you pay to move into a neighborhood creates the value for everybody in that neighborhood. So there are a lot of people who would cash out up north, and there were people here, you know, that grew up here like myself, you know, I got here in the 50s, that their families were being jeopardized. Profits started really big in the 80s. So there, you have to look at the public purpose, the overall good, before you uh, condemn or, you know, put something up on a pedestal, I guess we speak. What I'm, what I'm saying is, there's 54 exemptions on the books in Florida now, property tax exemption. Every one of them has a purpose. But if it doesn't benefit you, you may not see that purpose. So uh, when it comes to the taxing authorities, like with the fire districts, I think you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the Save Our Homes, the uh, homestead exemptions, they do not apply to their millages. Mm -hmm. So it was seen mosquito control, hyacinth control. That millage that they used the exemption doesn't come off of that millage because the concept was when they wrote those enabling acts that mosquitoes affect everybody. So nobody <laughs> should be exempt from paying. Same with fire. Fire can burn anywhere. It doesn't discriminate. So, so these, these, usually these things, at least the ones I've been involved, I feel totally, they're thought out. They're not just mm -hmm. plucked from the air. It usually right. takes a number of years before you'd be successful. So I, I, you know, I support most of the exemptions I see, but I don't support all of them. But I have no problem with veterans' exemptions because people give their blood for that. Yeah. So yeah. we all benefit one way or another. I went to school on the GI Bill and I thought it was great. But I had to get four years to do it. There's a question back here and then one else here. Did I answer your question? Well, I, uh, first of all, uh, my name is Bob Edmonds. I'm a student at Hodges. I know a few of you. <laughs> 
Um, I want to say thank you for being here and spending time with us because I know you have very tight schedules. Um, I just, I'm going to say this because I, I just recently been listening to an educational program that I'm listening on CD. It's, it's called Live Out Loud. So I'm going to live out loud for a moment. I'm going to say that I'm one of the, one of the individuals within the Hispanic community that would like to run at some point in the future for one of the either commissioner or in the state. Uh, uh, obviously, I'd like to educate myself better and look at the issues and really be balanced up. Uh, for me, it, 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 it has to do with what benefits the community. I like what Lee County, I was born and raised in New York City in the Bronx, um, and I worked there, and then I went to Chicago, and I worked there and lived there. And so I saw um, the counties, how they worked, and the offices, and I have to tell you that, that we have a great county. Um, yes. The employees are fantastic. Um, I have a small company called The Recorporation. I put on events. Um, and every time I put on events, if it's in county property, I have to fill out millions of pieces of paper. But um, you have professional people that help you right through. And, and it's, you know, it sounds bureaucratic. It drives you a little crazy, but it's excellent stuff. So I just want to say thank you for being so excellent of, of the county and, and the county government. My sister works for, for uh, uh, all of you, uh, I guess, in the county, because you work for the county attorney's office. Um, I want to ask a couple questions if I can, Carmen. Um, the, the first one would be to Sharon. You mentioned there's over 300,000 uh, uh, registered voters in Lee County. Um, how many of those are Hispanic? Um, we, I don't know for sure right now. I can pull some numbers and give them to you at any time. I am call my office. Uh, the only problem with that is, and we've talked about this with some of the other outreach groups that we've worked with, that particular question on a voter registration application is not one of the mandatory items that we need. It is optional. We don't always get people to fill that in. And that's the only reason why we even ask for that kind of information, uh, the sex of the voter, you know, what nationality they are. We just want that for data purposes. But a lot of people don't fill it out. We can, I can certainly let you know um, by just pulling it up with those that did answer that question, how many we have. And of the 300,000, how many were active voters? How many voted in the last election? Well, 360, we have about 367 active voters. Right. We have, or uh, 367,000, thank you, active <laughs> registered voters. We have about 20,000 inactive voters. So usually when we talk about people voting or at the numbers that we have, we don't necessarily include inactive, even though all you have to do is go vote one time and that activates your record. So our inactive voters right now have probably been about the lowest that they could be. We were very, very pleased that in, in 2008, Lee County had the highest percentage of turnout to the presidential election at 86%. It was quite a bit. I mean, it was amazing. Unfortunately, if you look at cities uh, like the city of Fort Myers, city of Cape Coral, just had their elections in 2011, the turnout was pathetic. And that's exactly how they quoted me in the paper when they asked me. It's pathetic. As far as I am concerned, there's absolutely no reason that a qualified person can get registered to vote and has the opportunity to vote. There's just no reason for them not to anymore. With early voting, you could get a ballot mail to your home and you do not need any reason for that. All you gotta do is call us and we'll send it to you. Or go into the polls on election day. Absolutely no excuse for that. That's why we're trying to get out in the communities and let people know these are the people that are gonna get into your pocket first. If you live, and the way I describe it is kind of like if you throw a pebble into the water, where that pebble goes in, that the first circle is the smallest. That's kind of like your city council. If you have a hole, a pothole on your street, I don't think if you call the president, he's gonna really care. But the guy next to you might, because he could be your councilman and live in that same district. So the farther you get away from your person that represents you, the less impact you're going to have on that person. And city elections are just so, so important. And we really, really try to push that a lot. So it's, it varies. We, we want to see more people get out when it's not a presidential election, but we certainly were pleased with OH results. Can I ask one more? One more. 
<laughs> it's actually row five, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, I'm really interested in finding out. Uh, I know that there is a lot of controversy nationwide regarding the districting and, and the voting and the, and the hours and locations. Is any of that changing or affecting Lee County voters in the low income areas? I mean, are there any changes that you're going to implement? We are looking right now at uh, redistricting. We're all holding our collective breath statewide for them to finally get this whole thing out of the court systems and get, get those lands approved. Um, and I understand that the um, Senate or the House lands were approved, but the Senate is still being questioned. We are definitely looking when we go into our redistricting and we start putting these lines down on the maps that. Some of the precinct locations that we have will be combined. Uh, we have an awful lot of small precincts out there uh, that are costing a lot of money. Because by law, we have to supply that precinct with a, a, the, the same number of people that, that could be at a bigger precinct based on the percentage of voters in that precinct. Um, it's a certain number that we have to supply it. Uh, that costs money. It, and, and elections are getting so much more expensive. So we are looking to reduce some of those. But one of the biggest trends that we have seen is that more people across the, the, the county are voting by early methods, either absentee or early voting, leaving the precincts with less people going there. So we are looking at that kind of history. We're not looking at a precinct just as a number of people. We're looking at it as a number of people who voted early that never went to the polls on election day. And that seems to be the trend. But we will be sure to make, you know, like I say, if you can't get your phone location, you can go early or you can uh, call and get a ballot mail. So, but they will be effective. And let me just give you one little bit of advice from a non-county commission person. This is something that I've seen with a lot of elections, being on the other side of the fence, not from the candidate side, but servicing candidates. They have a tendency to have illusions of grandeur at the beginning, and they'll go out for the highest position they can get. My advice is always start with the lowest one. If you live in a city, get involved in their planning, get in on some of their boards, then run for council person and work your way up instead of trying to take that big piece off the top. Let people get to know who you are and what you believe in first. good people that way because they get disgruntled when they don't win that big election. But if you st take it, take it small steps, much more worthwhile, we're not going to lose it for Linda? And I just wanted to make a comment. I've heard this question several times about how can, how can we get into, how could you win an election in an office where someone has been there for so many years? And in the constitutional offices, as you've gathered from this forum, those offices are very technical. They're very specifically um, driven by laws and statutes. And they're really very technical in nature. And they're usually not decision-making offices, but they're offices that perform um, responsibilities um, based on the statutes and the laws. And their, their real decisions are to do those jobs very efficiently and effectively and to the benefit of all their customers. And so that takes a lot of knowledge about what that office does. Those, all of those rules and statutes and laws are in the Florida statutes. They're in the offices. The clerk's office has thousands of policies and procedures. They're open to the public. You know, any, you have to do your research and really have to learn. For constitutional offices, I would recommend you really learn what those offices do. You have a good understanding and always important is to have a good concept of technology, how technology can benefit the business because, again, to, to perform all of the duties and responsibilities of all those technical um, uh, duties that you have to perform requires technology and using it wisely and using it very efficiently. Um, it's a tool that has to be in place to make those offices run well. And so those are the two things. You need leadership, you need knowledge,
I love going out to speak to people. So if I'm invited, I, if, unless there is an earth-shattering event in my household, which now lacks children because they're all older and, and we have grand, grandsons of our own, I will be at the events that I'm invited to and I, I look forward to accepting those invitations that I can talk to people no matter if there's 10 or 100. Um, I love to do that and I, I would very much, if you know some you know, organization uh, that would, would have us uh, come out and speak with you. Uh, we, I, I know we would be glad to be there. I, I certainly would, and I, I think I can speak to my colleagues. In the 30-some years I've held this position, I've always believed that the public wants to hear from the public official. Mm -hmm. Not all do that. Up here we all do, because I know all these people. But there are some office holders I've known that will send a deputy to speak in their spot. And, and I've never believed in that. I'm always the one that's a big part of my job is to go into community when asked. Sometimes I'll even seek you out and speak about the duties and responsibilities of the office because you need to hear it from the elected official, not the deputy. The um, Hispanic community are, are tremendous entrepreneurs uh, and many involved in small businesses. And so recognizing that it's the small businesses that are the bread and butter of our nation, it's, it's, it's with an understanding that it's going to be the small businesses that are going to allow for the recovery economically in this country. And so we need to do whatever we can to help promote small businesses, and that involves many in the Hispanic community. We do that through collaboration with the Southwest Florida Enterprise Center or a small business development center at Florida Gulf Coast University or uh, uh, the Hispanic program here at, at, at Hodges. Um, I, I am very proud of the fact that we've been working with not the Hispanic Chamber of Southwest Florida, but also HABA, the Hispanic American Business Alliance, in terms of, of promoting and supporting international relations like we do with the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, and recognizing that once we finally land that direct flight with Puerto Rico, you know, South and Central America are going to be right at our front door, uh, benefiting both those countries in South and Central America and here in Southwest Florida Lee County. So uh, we're going to continue to work uh, in partnership together. Um, I think Hodges is really says, taking a leadership role in engaging the community in a dialogue as it relates to Hispanic uh, issues, but more as Commissioner Judas said, uh, how you're uh, in this community, how you're um, interacting, and how we're getting information to you, not just us getting information from you. 21% uh, is Southwest Florida's Hispanic population, and a large part of that's here in the county. So you're right, you're a quarter of the population of Southwest Florida. Uh, there's different organizations that I reach out to uh, being proactive in calling and getting information. Uh, Carmen was kind enough to take me through and tour me and, and you know we made that call. Um, Carmen Salome, both of us are very, very involved in different organizations, uh, personally and professionally. Um, and so part of it is, as Commissioner Manning said, uh, making yourself open to the invitations or, or individual meetings that people want to share with you but also being proactive and trying to keep up to date with what is happening in our community and then reaching out and saying, uh, you haven't called me yet, but let me call you. Could you come and can you talk to me on the phone and tell me what you're doing or can I come and meet with you? So, you know, my office, we, we try to do both of those things and as many things as I'd like to think I attend, 804 square miles in the county. I'm uh, very blessed uh, to have uh, Karen Solome, uh, who is uh, by heritage Puerto Rican, uh, but that is also, uh, her children are grown, and so uh, she does work a lot of after hours, so we kind of, you know, take team the county and try to get where we can, where people want us, and we welcome the opportunity to talk to you individually, personally, face-to-face uh, -face on the phone, but be proactive as well, because it's hard for us to get to everywhere. I saw her at a meeting at 7 o'clock this morning, so I can attest to that. My office just recently agreed to um, bring in a uh, voting machine and some ballots and hold a mock election for some students that uh, Leonardo is bringing in under HABA. Um, we're going to be down there with our group and, and let them go through a voting exercise using the equipment that we use right here in Lee County. We're willing to lug that stuff anywhere we have to lug it. Um, and our tables and our tents, wherever we can put them up and, and help you out. I want to go briefly over an issue, and I don't know how many of you were familiar with it, but just read not too too long ago, about a couple weeks ago, 
Um, I received an email from our Division of Elections in Tallahassee from our local NBC TV affiliate here in Lee County. They sent them a list of voters that apparently they had gotten a summons to um, appear for jury duty. And on that, and they got them from Linda's office. Um, on that application, there's a place for them to check that they are not citizens, that they have to decline jury duty because of non-citizenship. And somehow the radio, the TV station got the list of people who had declined jury duty because they were not citizens and ran it against our voter registration database here in Lee County and in Collier. We had about 87 names that came out where these people were registered to vote and they were declining jury duty for because of citizenship. We we knew this has been an issue ever since they um, opened up voter registration back in 1994 with the National Voter Registration Act, which is better known as Motor Voter, where you can go into the Department of Motor Vehicles, get your driver's license, and they register you at the same same time. We could put an application anywhere at that point that we wanted to. We could put them in 7-Eleven if we wanted to. People just went, got the applications, filled them out. There is, the second question on there is, are you a U.S. citizen? Out of 87 people, we had a fairly decent number, I'd say a little bit better than uh, a third of those that sent documentation back saying, yes, I am a U.S. citizen. Now, did they lie to us or did they lie to the courts? That's, that's not up to me to decide. But I looked back and I saw that none of those people voted before they became citizens. But we had a whole pile of them that said, no, I'm not a citizen, and they voted. It could become a major issue in a very close election. I mean, 2000 election was only 537 votes statewide. But we have no way of knowing or, or getting that information about citizenship for somebody who's registering to vote. Right now we're getting reports from Linda's office of those people who are declining uh, jury duty because of non-citizenship on a monthly basis so we can at least start checking our records and sending people these letters. It is a third degree felony. There is a $5,000 fine. There could be jail time with this. I don't want to send anybody to jail. But I can't prevent that. We need to educate people who are coming into our country and into our, our county on um, what is really the right way to do this. A lot of it probably is to just get an understand, but that's not for me to decide. So we're going to be reaching out a lot so that when people come in, people you know, relatives, friends, let's get them going on the right track. So I don't have to say, you know, you did something that wasn't right. But I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but we'll be, we'll be Checking back with you folks a lot on that. Thank you. Before we conclude, I'd like to introduce one of the Hispanic Institute advisory committee members who's also here, Miguel Fernandez, who's coming out earlier. Thank you. Dr. Carmen, I just want to thank the panel for being here on behalf of the Institute. We try to do our best to uh, engage uh, government and uh, pass out information to our community so that both can get connected and feel better about what's going on in our community. So just want to thank you all for you know, taking your time and being here today. It's an important part of it for us. Uh, one of the things that I learned on this side, because I've also been a candidate out twice on, on two occasions, I want you to know that when you're speaking to elected officials, perhaps the first thing you should tell them, I am a registered voter. <laughs> believe it or not, believe it or not, I've gone to many political forums where the first word out of some of the candidates' mouth are, are you a registered voter? Because if you're not, the reality is, most of them don't want to hear you. So tell them when you engage them, I'm a registered voter. I think you're going to get their attention. I know they're here because they care about you. Thank you.
opportunities for educational exchange. This won't be the last of this type of forum, so I want to appreciate uh, all of you who made time to come here today. We will, in the future, hold other forums, and I, I wanted to mention, with regard to voting, Univision and the Institute also collaborated to do a campaign last election for the community, by the community, called Voto Cuenta. Uh, this was an initiative that was put together, again, to motivate and encourage folks in the community to cast their vote, because one of the challenges is that, especially within this population, we tend to register, but we, the vote doesn't materialize. So I was happy to hear today that there are different ways in which folks can cast their ballots, because we know in some communities there are issues with transportation, with child care, and many other things. So uh, it's, this is the reason why we hold these forms, so folks can really understand, number one, what the process is, number two, how to get engaged, number three, who they need to talk to. So I hope you remember these faces and I hope you took down their information because when they say, when they say contact me, they mean it. So take advantage. Thank you all and please